talking about scientific programming and um, techniques for trustworthiness and reproducibility in data analysis. Um, so who am I? Uh, I have my PhD in physics uh, from Stanford University and I did a postdoc in physical chemistry at UW. And uh, now I lead the data science team at a fusion startup, uh, Zap Energy, in Everett, Washington. And uh, we are trying to make the world's first fusion generator. Um, and uh, yeah. and um, yeah, my team is responsible for a lot of the data analysis that goes on there. And uh, I've seen a lot of data analysis code throughout my scientific career. Um, and so I want to share some things that I've learned to help you write code that can be reproducible, not only for uh, other people, but for yourself in six months, and um, also help protect against silly errors that might come up in analysis. So I'm gonna present four tips um, presented in the context of the latest paper that we've written based on our technique. And um, all this is gonna be using Matplotlib, and hopefully by the end of it, you too can make data that looks as happy as these little creatures here. Okay. Um, a tiny amount of physics context. Um, this paper is based off of a time-dependent temperature measurement we made of our plasma. Uh, the goal is basically to show that neutrons come out when the temperature goes up. So we have our plasma, we pinch it down, the temperature should go up, and then more neutrons should come out. Um, and that kind of validates that, you know, we're doing something correct, um, you know, worth uh, continuing in our investigation. Okay. So my first tip is um, make your plot exactly how you want to present it. I cannot tell you the number of times I've seen people make a plot and then put it into Adobe Illustrator and kind of change it a little bit. I promise you that Matplotlib has all the functionality you need to make your plot look the way you want it to. Um, so uh, you do not have to customize afterwards. So for example, things like set the figure size. That sounds so simple, but doing that, um, uh, using subplots. Please don't combine them after the fact. Um, customizing your axes, so like if you don't need um, the numbers, get rid of them. Change the text size, all these sorts of things. And um, annotate inside of Matplotlib. Please don't write these things in Adobe Illustrator after the fact, because you're gonna make it so that you might make a mistake, right? And there's another place where an error can show up in your plots. And let's see, what else did I need? Here we go. And then one of my favorite little things, I apologize it's getting cut off a little bit, is to have a color scheme. You don't wanna just use default colors, because if you try to reproduce your plot later, it may not be the same colors. So I actually make like a little palette um, and I often will grab some colors from a color map I'm using in other plots, I have like consistency through all my plots, and then I reference all my colors off of uh, this list of colors. Okay, tip number two is um, to use nested dictionaries, loops, and string formats to help make sure that you don't mislabel any of your data. So in this particular example, I had three different curves that all had different labels, and I wanted to make sure that I didn't accidentally swap them around. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll make a dictionary where the key is the label for the plot. Um, and then I'll just loop through my data and then um, pop that into my label. Um, so that way I don't accidentally like swap these labels around after the fact. Um, now of course you could make this a dictionary with classes, but a lot of times when we're doing data analysis, we're kind of a little loose and fast with what we're doing. And Sometimes you want to do that, but you could substitute in a class there as well. Okay, tip number three is to use pandas to keep your data um, paired up properly. So a lot of times in data analysis, we have lots of different sources of data, and we have to like pair them up properly to make the plot and have the right x, y coordinates. So in this particular example, I had three streams of data. I had my neutron rates, my temperature, and then the time when the measurement was taken. Those all came from different places. So I don't want to accidentally like shift my arrays by one uh, index and like mess the whole thing up. So what I'll do is I'll use a pandas data frame um, and uh, set my index properly and then kind of like pair them all up together. So in this example, um, my neutron rate, for example, 
has like data, calibration factors, or whatever goes in there. And then this unique ID called the shot number. And all of my data will have that unique ID shot number. So I'll set that as my index, and then just like put all the pandas data frames together and know that they're all going to be paired up properly. And that'll save you a lot of headaches as well. Okay, and my tip number four is to use version control. Um, and <laughs> um, this is not just for your code, but for your data and for your documents. So um, when you're doing a really important analysis, the first thing I do is I archive the data itself. So in this particular example, um, these two curves actually have since making this plot slightly changed their definitions in our pipeline, our data pipeline. Not so that you know the analysis changes that much, but they'll look a little bit different. So I made my own archived version of this data before I even started working on it. Um, then you want to version control your document. So I was using um, Overleaf, which has history, so that kind of has it already. Most software packages do now. And then um, what I like to do is push my code every time I'm about to show my data to someone, and I'll actually put a note that says, I'm about to show this to my manager. This is like the version to go back to. So that when I talk to them in a week's time, and they're like, hey, what changed? I can easily go back and see what happened, and also see that in the document itself. And that way, you never have to do this, figure underscore version 21. You always just save it as its name, and you can always go back to that version of the figure. And then my bonus tip is to ensure that your code works on Mac and Windows. So usually when you're doing analysis, the main thing that's going to be different between Mac and Windows is the path where your data is stored. So I like to use pathlib. Um, that kind of hides a lot of that. And what I'll do at the top of my code is I'll just um, set the path to where my data is, depending on if it's Mac or Windows, and then from there on out, I'm agnostic. And then you two can be as happy as these two holding hands under the rainbow. Um, and then that's it. Thank you.
So like, um, how do you write your code so that it could take in many different kinds of data, basically? Um, I think that would be specific to like the constraints that you have on saving the data and like different file formats. Um, so maybe we could talk about it more afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. but I cannot enforce it outside of my group. Um, but I will say that um, we do, you know, actually do a pretty good job of version control of the um, software itself, like our Python scripts, I think that's pretty good. Um, but uh, yeah, within my group, I think we're pretty consistent at least. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.